Fire Your Boss Fridays. I'm your ever curious host, Chad Pesa, and joining me is the unstoppable force of love herself, Lisa Hart. We have a very cool guest in the hot seat today, Rachel Allen. You can see her. Rachel's got a motto that's straight out of the spell book. We make words make money. And that really stood out to me. I mean, is this some kind of modern alchemy? <laughs> Well, we're going to find out. Enough of me rambling about the ins and outs of this podcast. Rachel, before you drop all this heavy wisdom on us, let's give a shout out to our listeners and uh, tell them how you ended up in the hot seat on a podcast like Fire Your Boss Fridays. Uh, hello, hello. Thank you so much for the intro. I ended up on Fire Your Boss Fridays because I've actually never had a boss other than me. I went to school for journalism and, uh, you know, did everything right, got straight A's, did the whole thing, interned at NPR, and then graduated in 2008. And nobody was hiring journalists, but especially not journalists from rural Tennessee, which was where I was from. So I sent out 200 resumes and I got zero responses back. And the only job I could get was unpacking boxes in the warehouse at Old Navy on the 5 a.m. shift. So I was like, well... Me and all the other humanities grads, you know, not exactly what I intended with my life. So I did that for about six months. And then in my 22 year old brain, I was like, you know what? Bet they have jobs in Hong Kong because that's the furthest away I could think of from Tennessee. And it turns out that they do indeed have <laughs> jobs in Hong Kong, <laughs> but you need this little piece of paper called a work visa, which I did not get before I left. So I flew to Hong Kong and I stranded myself with about $200 in my bank account. And I'm Googling like how to make money online because it's 2008 and that's what you do. And I saw this job pop up and it was like copywriting. And I'm like, huh, I don't know. How hard can that be? And I gave it a try. And now 15 years later, here I am actually running a marketing consultancy. Wow. Yeah, yeah I think it's cool. I, I love most about that story is... Uh the cojones that you had to make that happen. It really helped right? being 22. I mean, that's a lot of bravery and courage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, bravery, courage. And so also, do you, do you still have that same sense of courage? You know, I think, um, I don't know. The things that have always been most objectively courageous in my life have always just kind of had the same emotional resonance for me of doing as doing my laundry. So um, I feel really brave when I have to do other things like, uh, I don't know if I, you know, have to tell my neighbors to turn their music down because it's too loud. Then I'm like, oh, like getting ready for that. <laughs> but flying across the world to, you know, live in another country and start a business. That's, you know, it's easy. Yeah. How long did you, were you in Hong Kong? Uh, about two years there. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So would, would you ever consider moving back there? Or? Oh yeah. I loved it. It was absolutely yeah. wonderful. Yeah. So yeah, I did two years there and then I actually ended up living nomadically for the next 10 years after that. So I like bounced around and moved about every six months and, um, but I loved Hong Kong. It was so fabulous. Nice. We kind of did something similar to that as well. Mm -hmm. So do you like being a nomad or do you like having furniture and stuff? <laughs> I'm trying out the furniture thing. This is like my first uh, sort of furniture based house <laughs> and endeavor. <laughs> so, you know, I like it so far. I did the living out of suitcase thing for about 10 years. And, you know, as you know, it, it's really cool. Mm -hmm. And also sometimes you're like, I need a couch. <laughs> like I want a couch <laughs> that I like. <laughs> right. Yeah. We went through that too. So it's pretty interesting journey. That's why I asked because we didn't own furniture for a long time. Yeah. And we actually thought, why do people own furniture? Yeah. Right. Because if we all just move around and don't take our furniture, we could all be all right. We yeah. really could. The first time I had to hire a moving truck to move things, I was so. like, what is, who have I become? What is happening with my life? Right. Who have I become? Oh no. Right. You're like judging yourself. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. This, we make words make money has just got me absolutely fascinated. You mind if we jump into the nuts and bolts of this? Yeah, let's do it. It's very intriguing. And I'm dying to know, how did your journey from this journal journalism to copywriting, which you didn't know anything about, mm -hmm. right? And to you landing this amazing catchphrase, which is the first thing you see on your website, is totally cool. What sparks a passion to just go after it? Like you started doing copywriting. So I'm setting the stage here. And then you realize, when did you realize that this bolt for blue was going to happen and you were going to do this thing instead of just you know, something else, right? Because this was just a shot in the dark, yeah. essentially. Yeah, absolutely. So it was about four years in, I had been writing and doing freelancing, and I was actually sort of living the entrepreneur dream. Uh, I was living on a Greek island, and I would work in the mornings, and then I would like sunbathe on the beach all afternoon and be served orange juice by strapping young Greek men every morning. And I was 
miserable. I was so anxious. Not the plan. <laughs> like the economist will never hire me. I was having panic attacks the entire time. Cause I was like, I've been doing my side gig for four years yeah. now. And this is, this is mm -hmm. now. So, um, I kind of got into it and I had this moment of truth where I was like, okay, I've been doing my side gig supposedly for four years. It's starting to look like a real business, but I'm not going to say that out loud because that sounds final and serious. And like, I don't know anything about running a business. Mm -hmm. So I decided instead to get a master's degree because that seemed like the most next adulty type thing I could do. But I kept running the business while I was getting the master's degree. And at the end of the year, they were like, Hey, you should stay on and do a PhD. Like, you know, we really loved having you, you could do this. And I was like, ah, oh, the business is just more fun. So I ended up um, deciding to go all in on it about, yeah, I was five years in and um, then, you know, tried to make it into a, a for realsies thing. For realsies. I like yeah. your terms, adulting, growing <laughs> up. Yeah. Uh, you obviously have a way with words and you're using them here today. So I like it. I <laughs> got a skill. Do you ever have an aha moment when you realized that you could turn this into profit? What was your long-term goal? Did you go, I'm going to make millions? <laughs> or did you say, this might actually just be a good business? Mm -hmm. Was it, Did you have a bigger goal or dream of of making it farther than you did? Are you still on your way? Where are you in that, that Ooh, journey? So I'm actually in a really, I'm kind of in a pivot with that journey right now. So when I first started out and really mm. for like, I don't know, first five, six years, I was like, I just need to pay my rent. Like that's all that needs to happen here. I want to pay my rent. <laughs> right. I don't want to go into a job where I have to have fluorescent lighting overhead all day. And I never want to unpack another box of $5 t-shirts. So that was like my core motivation. And mm -hmm. after I started doing it, I started seeing actually the power that entrepreneurship can have. You know, it's one of our most democratized access points to power. And then I was like, oh, this is actually like, this could be something cool. I could use this as a force to build a world I want to live in. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you did have an aha moment. That was it yeah, right yeah. there. I could use this to create the vision of life I want. This would be the tool or the vehicle that I would use to get yeah. there. And I, I actually love that you articulated that because I never thought of it that way. But yeah, that was the moment where I was like, okay, that's actually why I'm doing this other than I enjoy food and shelter. <laughs> <laughs> I once talked to my, it was it Anne? It was, she's your aunt, Lisa, isn't she? Or how, how, who, who's Anne? Yeah, she's my aunt. Okay, so I hadn't met Anne before, but I'm talking to Anne about a similar place, Rachel, that you, you can probably resonate with was like, we were like traveling, we didn't have furniture. And I was like, oh, you got to live the simple life. And she goes, she looks at me and I'm here just, I don't know, some new ager in her backyard, right? Talking about this lifestyle. And she goes, you know what? I like my bathroom. I like my furniture. Why? She says, because when I was growing up, we had an outhouse. She goes, I will never live without indoor plumbing and my own furniture. And, uh, and the way she said it was like, yeah. I am kind of an, I'm speaking very arrogantly that like, here I am trying to detach Ooh. myself. I had a different mission than yeah. her, right? She started in a different place than me. I'm trying to digress. And she's obviously spent her whole life getting indoor yeah. plumbing, right? So it's a totally different story. And so she definitely put me in check. And I was like, you know what? You're right. There are some of us who are in the most successful time of their life having indoor yeah. plumbing, right? So there's no need for them to even consider digressing. Like some of us may be privileged or had a op better opportunity, which many of us do in America. It's a great opportunity space. We just digress so that we can you know, create some space really because there's so much going on. I did it for me. It was just mental yeah. space, you know, ultimately, right? Did you find that you had the same clarity you know, when you're off doing something, you know, abroad or on a beach somewhere and like there's, you don't have yeah. things, right? Do you feel like that helped you stay focused rather than being in the bustle of things and, and, and owning a lot of things? Do you feel like that helps focus at all? You know, that's a really good question. I, I think it probably did, but also I, you know, I grew up uh, relatively poor, not, you know, not crazy poor, but we didn't really have a lot. And so I never really had a whole lot of influx of stuff to begin with. 
So I suppose, mm-hmm. you know, um, I never really dealt with the like divesting myself of stuff. Now that's what I'm going through now. I'm like, oh my God, the couch, it weighs so much. I have to like get a friend. I know the way you said that earlier. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or these shelves you can see behind me. My husband made these shelves for me and uh, they're wonderful, but also he's a metal worker and he made them out of steel. So they're so heavy every time we have to move. And I'm just like, oh, there's a gravity. Oh, right. So it. if there's an earthquake, they're also safety devices. Exactly. Right. right? Yeah. <laughs> I can just hide under them and everything will be fine. Like no tornado will ever take me with those things. <laughs> they are so heavy. <laughs> <laughs> but I did feel um, I had a really big influx of like input, right? And, you know, maybe you experience this as well as you're traveling because you don't have stuff, but you do have new experiences every day. And, you know, getting to learn mm-hmm. how people in Budapest make their coffee, you know, or, you know, right. what it's like the to. Simple things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I feel, I mean, to me, that was incredibly rewarding just to be able to have all of these different experiences happen. Yeah, that's cool. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, Yeah. because I tap into that quite a bit. And like some of my students, you know, trying to explain to them that like maybe the problem why they can't get anything done is there's too much stuff going on. Like you really just don't have the capacity to do it mentally. Just too much. Like you can put fool in yourself. You can't add more. Oh, gosh. You need to get rid of some things and create some space. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the other thing, though, that I tell people when they're like, oh, and this is like before the pandemic and people started working at home more, they were like, I could never focus working at home. And I was like, yeah, well, paying my rent's a hell of a motivator. Like if I don't do it, (laughs) right, I don't survive, you know? Right. Absolutely. So copywriting is paying the bills. What's your pivot? You got me interested. I don't know if you want to go into it and share it uh, with the world it. yet, or if there's going to be some big release. And you're going <laughs> no, to, it's not what a big are secret you pivot. Into? I'm curious. <laughs> Yeah, so no, it's no, it's no secret. Um, So I've been really focused on sort of the nuts and bolts of copywriting for a really long time and doing, uh, you know, sales pages and blog posts and emails and like the actual writing of them. And I still do that. But along the way, I've started realizing that what I really enjoy out of that the most is the strategy and getting to develop the Mm. content strategy and helping people build their businesses around that. So I've been doing a lot of CMO work. um, So uh, chief marketing officer work and people bring me in as their fractional CMO and helping people build like the structures to get their business off the ground or maybe you know they have a launch coming up or something and being able to be like okay here's the the master plan and then actually Mm -hmm. go and write all this stuff too has been great so i'm i'm pivoting to be more focused on strategy than implementation wow yeah that's cool i love strategy because it's like it's a big play and watching it all come together and then uh, having it be a success of course there's failures and hiccups but Watching a big, big plan come together is amazing. So putting a blueprint like that together would be, uh, I'm going to tap into that in a minute, but I'm going to open the stage for my wife here because I think she's got some, some biting (laughs) questions she wants to throw at you. Lovely. Yes. So you had mentioned that you can do it for love and not for money now, Mm -hmm. your, your work. So I was just wondering, do you have any advice that you could give to our listeners about committing to entrepreneurship for the love of it and not for the money? Oh, gosh, yes. Yes, yes. So whenever anybody asks me, uh, should I become an entrepreneur? I say, okay, here's, here's what entrepreneurship is. Entrepreneurship is where almost nothing is your fault and almost everything is your problem. (laughs) <laughs> and most of the people, the light dies in their eyes when I say that, because they're like, well, that sounds horrible. Right. But a couple yeah. of people run, run. get excited. <laughs> <laughs> Right. But if if you get excited by that, then this is the perfect job for you because literally all I do all day is just solve problems in different ways. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, it's, I, the thing I've been working with lately so much of is I'm doing, um, I'm a CMO for a law firm that's doing a service where you have to make it, you you basically can design a personalized trust, but without having to go to a law firm. Mm -hmm. So it's really cool. But the infrastructure on the back of that, I'm like, okay, now I have to make type form play with Notion, and then that has to play with Gavel, and so it's all this like little fiddly like figuring out stuff, and that's incredibly rewarding. But that's what I would tell people if they're thinking about getting into entrepreneurship. You have to think of what you love, not just in what you love doing. So you know, we'll see people uh, try to translate their hobbies into a business, and then they actually figure out they hate doing that because mm-hmm. it's cool to right? crochet rugs, but it's awful to crochet them for money. <laughs> So like you have to think about the, yeah, 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 no, you have to think about like the, the mechanisms that you enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. If it's you enjoy making, then go make, like, don't do that for money. That's horrible. But if you enjoy solving problems and if you enjoy having like 
nothing ever really work, but you're constantly making it work better, then I would say definitely get into entrepreneurship, but don't follow the big lie of like, oh, I'm going to get in. I'm going to have my 90 day business plan. I'm going to make seven figures in my first year. <laughs> it's, just, it's you'll, you'll lose. It'll be bad. Yeah. Right. Well, you're in for a rude awakening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, some people do get lucky. That is a great analogy is because it's almost like the there's an elusive part of it that you don't even know what you like or don't like about yeah. it. Like you didn't know this at first. You didn't say, I'm going to do that. And so yeah. I think there's a part of it that you need the courage first and just the, the idea that you don't like said the other thing. Yeah. So I'm going to go after something else. And on that journey, hopefully the goal is that you find that kind of elusive between the lines thing that you love mm -hmm. and then you can take the vehicle and create it around that and be that character in that role and I think it's really really awesome that you've actually found it I because mm -hmm. not everyone does right yeah. or they get stuck in the hamster wheel of you know sale after sale after sale after sale or or money yeah. right see money's gonna make you chase something that is even farther more elusive, right? Than oh, yeah. this. Once you find this, you've made it. Yeah, exactly. You don't have to do more. You just are that thing, right? Mm -hmm. But if it was just money, then you'd have to chase again. Oh, we're going to have bigger numbers this year, blank, blank, blank. And we've all seen that happen on why companies that go, pri or go from private to public, oh, they gosh, start yeah. losing uh, customer service goes down and like, there's all these things that people know. And that's because the company's chasing the dollar. Now it's not a private company. It's not, it's not holding customers and, and focusing on the product. It's, it's like, we need a bottom line number so that mm -hmm. the stockholders can see a gain. Yep. Right. And so that's on a big scale, but on a small scale, what you're saying is you've, you've essentially made it to your happy place. Yeah, I think so. And I think, you know, but I absolutely made the mistake of chasing the numbers for a couple of years in the middle there too. And I, I was like, oh, I really want to bring my business to a seven figure revenue just because that sounds cool, you know? And that was literally my only yeah. motivation. And so right. I spent a lot of money trying to make that happen. And it wasn't actually in alignment with what I really wanted. Cause what I really want is to do mm. as much work as I want to do, have enough money to pay my bills and also save some stuff and eventually buy a house and then do the work with people I really care mm -hmm. about. And so like, that's, right. that's what motivates me. And then having this goal up there, I made decisions in the business that were not right for me, that were not right for the business. They weren't a lot yeah. in alignment. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And it totally blew up in my face. Yeah. We talk about that all the time is like, it's not about f building your blueprint first or people say, oh, I want to find my purpose. Cause we've been down this road. We're obviously trying to coach people, not only with our podcast, but outside of the podcast. And I, I realized something re very recently is that you need to find your truth first mm. before you can find or go after your purpose or your goal or whatever it is. Because without that truth, you're going to make all these bad decisions and so yeah. you might wind up in, you know, la la land, nowhere near where you thought you would. Yeah. Because you don't know your truth. You don't know your, like your core part, the part of yourself that's like, I align with that. And I look at it like from a construction standpoint, which is my major background uh, outside of music is on a project. If I can't identify, it's going to be a flip or like, I'm going to just flip the house or if I'm going to rent it and keep it right. I need to make that decision at the beginning because if I don't, yeah, every time I need to make a financial decision, I might buy the wrong thing because on a property I'm going to keep and rent. I might buy the countertops are too expensive or whatever mm. the deal is, but my core end result needs to be there first. Or I'm going to, I can't make any logical decisions moving forward. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's what kind of happened to you is you put this thing that was like not in alignment or your truth. And then all the decisions you made send you off in la la land. Right. So yeah. I love that you basically live that, that kind of analogy that I use for people to help them, you know, kind of identify their goals. And here you are. So yeah, that's cool. So you've been on the journey, the journey that, you know, into entrepreneurship. So yeah, living case cool. study right you here. Got, you got another one for release I, that opened up a pretty, I pretty do, big yes. dialogue there. <laughs> yeah. So kind of some, uh, I guess some shop talk in your territory. Yeah. So I noticed on your website, you mentioned that you can tell exactly where and why people are falling off and not buying your clients thing. 
which is like, that, that's yeah. like a superpower, I think. <laughs> Yeah. But I think oh, it's, a, it's a really right? common outside of just making words make money. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that's a really common problem. So people will build a website or have copy, you know, and then nothing happens. So what are some mm -hmm. practical tips you can give to our listeners outside of hiring you, of course, to fix it, but <laughs> um, <laughs> that, you know, how they, what tips would you give them to help them avoid that problem to begin with? So the first and most obvious tip is going to sound so dumb and everybody's gonna be like, no, like, I don't need to do this. Everyone needs to do this. Draw a map, like, like take out a giant post today. I have giant post-its that I hang on my wall and literally draw a map of every single place somebody can come into your business and then every single place they can end up and then draw a line from like one all the way across to all the things. So, you know, if you've, so pe places people can come in would be, you know, your social media, your newsletter, uh, if you've got a freebie or a download, if you do speaking, if you have a book, whatever, every single thing, all the way across to every single product you sell. And if you can't draw an unbroken line from every entry point to every end point, then something's gotten messed up in the middle and people are falling off. Oh, and nobody dang, really thinks write that, that down. Actually. <laughs> right? <laughs> Nobody thinks about that though. Cause they're like, Oh, like I'm going to, I'm going to do a newsletter yeah. opt-in. Fantastic. Where does it go for who, what is like, does it actually lead to anything? Or did you just, you know, you spend an afternoon messing around uh -huh. on Canva. So that's the most important thing is just literally draw a map. And if you can't figure out what's wrong, one, make it visually larger. So this is one of the best tips anybody ever gave to me. This is Brandy Olson of uh, Real Work Done. She was a client of mine and she was like, okay, if something is complex, make it visually larger and then you can see what's going on. So I'll literally cover my walls and post-its when I'm doing work for clients and like draw out their business like on my walls I here. See that. I want to see that Instagram post of you <laughs> in your working environment over there. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I know I just did one too. I should have left the post-its up and I could have like scrolled you around and showed <laughs> right. you my, that would have been my so walls cool. I would have loved to see that because you're, <laughs> I mean, I think it's true, Lisa. I had done that before, but not at the level you're saying. And I love that that advice came up because these, I call them like mind maps, right? They're just, they're basically yeah. glorified mind maps, right? But based, but just for your yep. business. And, and I think it's really cool, but do it for, that's just amazing advice. I think you do it with almost anything. Yeah. Like there's so many applications for that mind map where like, if you're going to do this, is it going to equal that result? Why do mm -hmm. we do things like this when we're entrepreneurs? Because like you said, if it isn't going to end up where you want it to end up, then what happens is I think entrepreneurs and anyone who takes a, a, a risk on themselves in a business, maybe it will never end up there. And then you're frustrated or you feel like you failed, but yeah. you, you didn't, you actually you're starting something that would never have finished, but had you just planned first and watched it finish kind of in advance is sort of the manifest for the trip, for the journey. You have mm -hmm. to draw the map first or the blueprint. I mean, otherwise yeah. maybe it doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, to bring it back to your construction metaphor, I could start, like, if I started building a house, I could have a middle of the field. Then like, I'm going to start by building my kitchen cabinets and then sort of build a house around that. And like, maybe a house is going to come <laughs> right. together like, or to, I can right? use a blueprint. <laughs> it doesn't matter how skilled you are or how amazing you are. Even you or anyone else that you've worked with or we worked with, if you don't have a plan, it doesn't matter your skill set. You could put the best carpenters on one house with no blueprint and the worst carpenters on another house with a blueprint. There's a good chance the people with the blueprint are going to build it right and yeah. faster because they don't have to keep going to the person with the blueprint and asking them or without like, hey, what did you want me to do here? They yeah. have the whole plan. This is how you hire a team because the yep. team can look at your plan. They don't need to call you. They don't need to talk to you because you have a plan. Everyone can look at the plan and do their job. Exactly. Yeah. And so. I think we see a lot of times entrepreneurs, or I don't know, maybe you've seen this with your people, but I have clients come to me and they're like, oh, I don't want to make a plan because that's going to like, don't cage me in, don't lock me down. And I'm like, no, the plan is freedom. If we get along and we start doing the plan and you don't like it, we'll do something else. But if we're trying sure. to just constantly generate, then that's so much bandwidth that we're using when we could just have the plan and follow it. So sure. yeah, do you see that with your clients as well? Well, I mean, I've seen it with people all, all the time, especially people who come to us and say, oh yeah, I love what you guys are doing. I'd love to start a business. And then as soon as you start talking about the step-by-step -step process, it's, 
whoa, it's just, it gets pretty heavy quick. And that's the whole point. You can't, <laughs> yeah. like you said, there's no bandwidth. It's just, it's way too big to digest. You can't hold all that information. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, um, I see that we definitely align on that level, which is awesome. So I'm not crazy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, I think that ties back into what Lisa was saying too, you know, about like advice for people who want to start entrepreneurship. I think what we see is people get into it and they're like, oh, this is gonna be fun. It's gonna be awesome. And it is, but also it's never going to not be hard. Like it's just going to be a different kind of hard every time, every, every single day. And that's fantastic. Like if you love that, you love that. But if you're getting into this, cause you're like, I'm going to make the internet my ATM and only work four hours a week, do something else. There are easier ways to make a lot of money. Cool. So I created a, a new segment here, Rachel, just for you. Exciting. Okay. But this new segment is called asking for a friend <laughs> because <laughs> you know, my friend definitely needs this advice. All right. He, yeah. And here's the thing. He has a ton of scattered content. It's a jumbled <laughs> mess of ideas, basically unorganized nightmare. How, how do you work your magic and turn that chaos into a master plan? Do you have a, a system that you constructed over time or are you using something you learned in school or like, how do you take someone like my friend and make that happen? I've known a lot of your friends uh, who have that same <laughs> <laughs> issue <laughs> and uh, a lot of my friends do too. But the, what I do, I have a lot of people come to me with this, especially maybe they've had a podcast for years, or um, I see this, especially with people who've written a bunch of books, you know, and like, they just content like falls out of their face every time they move around, but they mm -hmm. don't really have a strategy with it. So the first thing I do is I'm like, okay, like let's back up, zoom out. Like what's the business strategy here? Because we can, I can organize your content all day long, but it needs to be towards an end and you're doing it for a business. So first of all, we talk about the business strategy and figure out what we're doing here. Then I'm like, send me everything. So people have sent me like 10 year backlogs of content and I'll look through all the blogs and all the pods and the videos and the speaking gigs and the scripts and the books and whatever else they have. And then I start sorting it. And what I look for is themes and outliers. So this um, actually works also when you're thinking of blog content, by the way, so a little side tip. So you want to look for themes, which is what's the stuff I say over and over and over and over and over again. And then outliers, which is what's this like one weird thing that I can't make fit into any other category, but I can't not talk about it for some reason. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times your outliers will actually lead into something new that you've really wanted to talk about for a long time, but you haven't been able to really get there. Then I organize it in terms of this map that we were talking about. I call that a content infrastructure because it serves like the infrastructure of a city. And then we fill in blanks. Um, we might use things for different types of content. You know, all content is modular and scalable. So we can take whatever you've made and then turn it into other stuff and then just fit it into the map and then keep on going. Okay. So that sounds like people who have content where they have already got off the ground and building their business and even tried to get their message out. Let's take a step back where they're not anywhere near that, right? Are, or is that a customer for you? Maybe yeah. that's not a client for you. No, is, no, would that be a good fit? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I work with people who have had, you know, businesses forever. And I also do a lot of work with founder led businesses that are in their first like 18 months to five years of business. Is your question like, how do they know what to create to begin with? Or what are we talking yeah, possibly. about? Possibly. So for my friends specifically, it would be like just journal entries on a certain yeah. topic that have been, there's really nothing has been technically released, mm. just trying to build the brand and get the idea out there, but isn't quite sure how to put the words together to make money. Right. And so yeah. would that be an ideal customer or how would you handle it from there where they don't have any organized content? But you, as you know, it sounds to me like you had mentioned that creating some coherency across the board is, is really, really important, right? And you're able to identify that? I think she already described your friend pretty well and how she would help. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What I would encourage your friend, so same process, Lisa, you're exactly yeah. right. But same process for your friend is to think, my first question would be, you know, you've been journaling this on this for a long time and it's never turned into a business. Do you actually want it to be in your business or do you just want it to be in a journal or maybe a book, which is a different type of endeavor. So mm -hmm. that would be my first question. If you've been doing it for sure, if your friend has been doing it for so long, <laughs> um, what does your friend actually want out of this? And then 
we would go like that was sort of determine the next steps from there. But from there, it's basically the same process. You figure out what you want, what we're actually doing with it. And then we can reverse engineer a map to get there. Nice. And that's the strategy part that you talked about earlier that you're kind of pivoting to. You feel like that's going to be your new superpower. And then yeah. do you write books for people too? That's my sort of secret side job. I've okay. been a ghostwriter and developmental editor for 11 books now. So mm -hmm. yeah, I had a bunch of clients who would be like, will you please write a book with me in three years? I was like, I don't do that. You know, I'm a marketer. I can't, but I would have mm -hmm. people say like, oh, please, you're the only person I've ever wanted to do this with. And I was like, all right, one, do one. I'm going to try it out. Mm -hmm. That's it. And then now we've had 11, 11. books later. Now, you, now people <laughs> exactly, have to ride yeah. you with Ferraris and stuff, right? Like they have to <laughs> they're look out your front window and tell me no. <laughs> exactly. That's how I take payment. <laughs> right. Oh, just one Ferrari? Uh, yeah, sorry. I've had I don't get out of bed for one already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you honestly believe that the words make money. What's the way that you orchestrate them? This is something you've developed over time, I'm sure. But I believe in this. Like, no matter what you're doing, whether it's you're writing a song, you know, or writing content or a, a post or whatever it is, the exactly yeah. the way it's orchestrated is critical. Very critical. I think to the tune of like, you can't technically overthink it. What's your feedback mm -hmm. on that statement? I think you're exactly right. And I think that it, it's possible to overthink it, but I don't think it's possible to over engineer it. Perhaps that's a better word you know, you mm. work in the music world. I, like I think that. you'll, you'll, you'll track my, my metaphor. I'm getting a little metaphysical for a minute, but the way that I, I um, see words in the world is that, you know, we have ideas and then we have like tangible carbon based reality and the writing that makes money, the writing that changes worlds, the writing that makes songs that we listen to over and over again. Writing is a way to take those ideas and turn them from energy into stuff really effective writing. It's as high fidelity to the original idea as possible. So it's a, there's as less static, as less distortion in the translation as possible. So when you say overthink it, yeah, mm -hmm. I think people do like get up in their own heads about it, but you like, we can all feel that clear resonance, you know, when you're writing a song or you're writing a post or whatever, and you're like, oh, that's it. Like, that's the word. <laughs> and that's when mm -hmm. you have this very high fidelity translation. The way the words come together. Yeah. yeah especially in music and i get it in in what you we're, we're doing here like we're trying to translate and we're but we're using a set of rules music doesn't use those same set of rules right mm. we're orchestrating this under english language 101 to the best degree possible so there's almost another element it's like okay but we can't just do whatever we want <laughs> we can't just we can't just go from the middle of a sentence and start rhyming for no reason right like you have to, there's sort of, mm. sort of principles and punctuation and a song, the way you write something, yeah. lyrics never look like the song. If you see a, a musician's lyrics, they never, you couldn't look at them and go, oh, that's, I can see the whole melody mm. here. No, that's not yeah. how it works. So, but with what you do, it is kind of like that. You have to make the punctuation yeah. perfectly. You have to stop the sentence in the right place. And all these things that you do to create the song or the rhythm mm -hmm. of what they're 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 saying. So there's a little teeny bit different, but I love it. And it's almost more challenging, it seems yeah. like. Because you don't have all the elements to play with. Well, yeah. And I think that you're bringing up a really important second element of it is that, you know, great writing is it's high fidelity and it must also be gracious because um, mm -hmm. what I mean by that is it needs to be inflected in such a way that it makes it really easy for you to take in. Because I can write something super high fidelity in my journal and that's just for me, right? Like it's, that's a, that's an audience of one, but if I'm wanting to communicate with you, that's gotta be a two way street. And we actually co-create that meaning and we can get into like some really nerdy linguistic theories about how that happens, mm -hmm. but it's our agreeing to come into a relationship around them. But yeah, as we're connecting, we co-create meaning. Mm -hmm. My words don't inherently have meaning as I write them. It's just ink on the page. And so that's what you're talking about with inflecting it and getting it right and everything. That's showing up with the, the grace that the idea needs to be presented with. Well, you just won my heart, Rachel. You said <laughs> all you. the perfect <laughs> things right there, in, including linguistics. I mean, you get it. You certainly get it. And I know that just by 
hearing that one paragraph there. That was amazing. So yeah, yeah you yeah. got what it takes to make this happen, which you're already making it happen. <laughs> it's so cool. But we are happy to have you on our show. We get someone this badass. This is amazing. <laughs> yes. So you are a deep, deep lady. Um, it may not look like <laughs> it right you. at it's first, fun. right? But th that statement says a lot about the way you look at, at your writing. I think that's amazing. Lise, did you have anything yeah. else there you wanted to drop on, on Rachel? Well, yeah, just so how does someone work with you um, and kind of what does it look like? What's the process look like to work with you? Uh, so we always start with conversation. I know a lot of people are like, oh, you should just like do a form and shove them through a process. And I'm like, that's boring. I don't want to do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we always start with a conversation. Somebody books in a call with me and we just talk and see if we actually like enjoy each other's company and want to mm -hmm. like be in the same space with each other. Because a lot of what I yeah. do, it doesn't, you know, it might not seem like it, but it can get really intimate, you know, because it's your ideas mm -hmm. and they can feel so tender to you. And, you know, I mm. often have people cry when they're working with me Aww. or they're like, oh, are you also my therapist? And I'm like, I'm glad you're taking that away from this. <laughs> call and we get to see if we actually you know want to hang and then we talk about the objectives of the project and i yeah. see if that aligns with one what i'm interested in um and two what i have time for and if i if that's not a match then i'm like okay cool so i'm not the human for this but let me tell you who is and then i can usually refer them out to somebody else because i know everybody after doing this for so long mm -hmm. and then once we do that we agree on the project and actually talk through the strategy of their business okay this is what we're doing here's what it's going to look like and like, if it's a sales page or something, then we'll have a separate call where we sit down, I can understand the overall picture, then the strategy for this particular sales page. So if it's for a launch, if they have a new product, like whatever it is, and then I'll ask them if there's anything like about the subject I need to know. So for instance, I've had a client who is my, one of my very favorite humans in the world. He sells beef tallow based skincare, which sounds ridiculous, but it's actually fantastic yeah, for your skin. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. So he needed this crazy long sales page because that's like a huge cognitive lift, right? To be like, oh, you should use this on your face because you should. It's great. There's many reasons why we should. But, you know, I'll talk to a great skincare product, you know, then I get to understand really so much about the subject. And then like, okay, and I didn't know anything about it. So I'll be like, okay, so, you know, Matt, tell me, how did you come up with this? Why does this matter to you? Why is tallow? So then I'll go away and do the writing or, you know, co-create the strategy, whatever. Um, we'll do a couple edits and then I close out. Here's what we've done. And here's how you can use this for the best effect. And if I've noticed anything else about your marketing, I'll be like, also, you should do these things, whether you do them with me or somebody else. And then we just kind of like close out by leaving room for any other questions they might have. Because if I'm working with somebody, my responsibility doesn't only end with the sales page or whatever. <laughs> right? like, I'm not going to be like, oh, I noticed this about your social media, but I'm not going to tell you. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, <laughs> I'm going to tell you. you anonymous anonymous questions comments about... <laughs> in their post. <laughs> exactly. Hey, I heard this copywriter, Rachel's great. You should ask her about your social media. <laughs> oh, yeah. The way you're speaking, I'm hearing like it sounds to me like you re refer to yourself not necessarily as a copywriter. Like you feel like you're a marketing agency essentially, especially now with you're really moving into these strategies. For the CMO right? field, yeah. yeah, much more of a marketing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, marketing consultant, marketing exec. I don't know. I just, I tell people I word professionally, but yeah, that would be what I would put on a more W2 type job marketing consultant, I guess. Do you feel like the whole movement into like courses and and all the things that have been going on lately yeah. have really been a, also a big fuel to like making this a success for you. The fact that people are able to teach, uh, and we didn't have this 10, 15 years ago, right, Rachel, like courses and stuff were not the yeah. same way that they are now. Like people can get access to this information through other coaches and mentorships. And like, I think the education system is changing. People are learning directly from mentors now this we thought it, it went away for a while and it was like everyone's got to go to college to get an education to, and i really think people are tapping back into each other to like leverage themselves up and you're playing a big role in that because you're helping these these coaches and mentorships and people putting their messaging out there not just their business but on that level do you deal with a lot of that or do you feel like um what i'm saying is is uh helped you in your success the way it's changed so much? 
Yeah, you know, I think so. I think courses go through um, cycles of popularity in the online space. Right now, we're a, a little bit on the downswing mm -hmm. of a of a popularity cycle. We're getting more into, um, so we do courses and then we usually do small groups because people do big courses and they're like, I think we'll just cycle through it all and over and over again. But yeah, that's definitely been a thing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's like the rise of peer-to-peer -peer learning has absolutely been a huge thing for me because there's so many mm -hmm. people I work with. That is you know, right, I've yeah. worked with, oh gosh, what was this? Uh, she was a I'm trying to think of how she phrased her work, but she was a um, singing teacher who did therapy via singing lessons. And like, that would never be a thing that would really, really you know, hmm. you're not going to like set up an office and do that, but she can do that. And is apparently incredibly effective with it, you know, doing it out of her home. So being able to work with people like that, I think has been really helpful. And then there's been an industry that's grown up around that of helping people create courses and stuff. And so servicing that industry has been kind of like a dual thing for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's cool, man. You couldn't have jumped in the water at a better time, my opinion. Yeah. And people needed the help from you because essentially what you've just described, it gets people from nothing to something, right? The tan, yeah. the, you said yourself, the thought or the idea to the manifest. Yeah. And I say that a lot too. I call it the great manifest. When Ooh, it's in your head, that. nobody knows anything. <laughs> it, it, it means nothing to the world in your head. But if we can put it on paper, yeah. now other people yeah, can yeah, read yeah. it. You don't even and, have to I tell mean, them. I could get they so can just read it. Dirty about this, but that's what makes our species work. Like there's a there's a concept called shared intentionality that is apparently only unique to humans. And the fact that I can write something down on a piece of paper and show it to you, that's how we shape the sandbox, man. Like we're the only species that can apparently do that. Because way back when somebody had an mm -hmm. idea and told somebody else, and then poof, now we have fiat banking. Right. You know. Like yeah. that's how all of this comes about. Yeah, it's amazing. And then the final character in all of that, just for our listeners is, so you have idea to bring it into manifest, put it on paper. Okay, then now it's on paper. Now create a plan with that, right? So now we've got to map it out, whether that be a business plan or a blueprint. It, does, yeah. it doesn't have to be anything fancy. Like she said, Rachel literally said, draw some big circles. Oh yeah. Start it off with the, and draw lines. I mean, we can do that. Yeah. Anyone can do that. If you can't do that, you shouldn't be an entrepreneur. <laughs> Let's just make that the initial test right there. You can do that. And my, my secret pro tip that I share with people that always just makes them very happy. You, uh, if you have sliding glass doors or big windows, you can actually write on those with dry erase markers. And so if you don't have wall space, but you do have window space, use that and just draw like all mm -hmm. over your house. And that's how I do a lot of my planning. That's awesome. We'll have to yeah, share that tip with tips. Jeffrey. Or buy giant post-its. Those are great too. <laughs> yeah. No excuses what Rachel's saying. That's what yes, she's saying. No exactly. excuses. Rachel likes the giant yep. post uh, There'll be a link in the bio. Yeah, my affiliate link at 3M. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, shoot. Well, this has been a ton of fun. You are an absolute asset to the world right now. So keep it up. Keep doing what you're doing, Rachel. It's, uh, it's cool. People need you. My friend needs you. Uh, things like that, right? So, um, and plus, getting the message out there is so fun. We are all creators. Don't die with your dream inside, people. That's what Rachel's saying. She's here to help. Get that dream out. Share it with the world. Get your message out. You know, uh, put your put your authentic version yeah. out there. Like she said, there was the musician or the vocalist that yeah. was doing therapy through these vocal lessons, uh, the way I understand it, right? Like if you're if that's your unicorn, go be it. You have the right now's yeah. the time. There's never been a better time to go be that authentic version of you. It might not have worked 20 years ago, but it will work now in this current day and age. So get out there, be crazy, be strange, but be you and make money doing it. That's what it's all about. So wrapping up this episode of Fire Your Boss Fridays, remember the wisdom of Nelson Mandela. Talk in their language and you touch their heart. Thank you so much, Rachel. And always thanks to our followers, our listeners for hanging out with us. Today, Rachel Allen has shown us how to make words, make money. Are you ready to wield that power, people? Click the link in the bio. She has workshops. And like she said before, she's the way she starts is having a conversation with you to see if you guys jam together. So catch you all in about seven days for the next episode of Fire Your Boss Fridays. We are out. <laughs> <laughs>